I was thinking uh, when Olivia made mention of uh, her neighbor, Barbara, that didn't want to hear about God and, and uh, Celine's uh, family members who, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll come to church and then not show up. There is uh, in people a, t- a tendency to run away from God. There is a poem that's called The Hound of Heaven. It starts out, I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinth ways of my mind and in the midst of tears. I hid from him and under running laughter, up visited hopes of speed I shot and precipitated down titanic glooms of chasmed fears. I fled him. At the end of the poem, God speaks to the one who runs. Ah, fondest, blindest, weakest, I am he whom thou seekest. Thou dravest love from thee who dravest me. We are forever running away from true love. There is a difference between correction and condemnation. And we rarely ever notice the difference. We think that being corrected is being condemned. Condemnation is what the devil does. Correction is what the Holy Spirit does. He convicts us of our sin in order that we might seek Christ. Satan condemns us that we might lose hope. Psalm 118, you have that open? Yes. Verse 22 of Psalm 118, I'm going to quote a verse that we all quote out of context. And we all do it. But I want you to catch the meaning of this verse today. Verse 22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous In our eyes. Who is he talking about? Verse 24. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, do save. We beseech thee. O Lord, we beseech thee, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. This is the Lord's doing. This day is the day the Lord has made. It refers to the fulfillment of that scripture, Palm Sunday. God had established Palm Sunday for a reason. And today I'm going to tell you the reason. Thank you, sir. John, what chapter? Chapter 18, starting with verse 22. 118. 118. Yep. Second Timothy chapter two, verse fifteen. To complete out our lesson we didn't finish last week. You can't draw water out of a dry well. There are far too many preachers who get up behind the pulpit and expect God to fill their mouth when they haven't prepared. God can't dig out of you what you haven't put in. You gotta learn. You gotta study. I worked for 40 years with registered civil engineers, licensed land surveyors, and every precious one of them passed that test and walked backwards in their career for the rest of their life (laughs) and never kept up with what was going on. There was one guy out of Upland that had been a, a surveyor for 25 years, and he would remind you of it. And just, you know, keep adding the days of how many years he'd been a surveyor, drawing maps and going out and stuff. We had a meeting one time and we said, you said you found this monument during your survey. Yes, yes, I found that monument. And the boss reached out from underneath the table, laid it on the table. We dug that monument out last year. And here it is. There is no way you could have found it. Blah, 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 blah. It was horrible working with this guy, and every time he had a job and the people started complaining that the city was holding up, 
or wherever I was working, was holding up the job of these clients. The boss would come down. The extra boss would come down. My boss would come. We'd have a meeting. Why are you doing this? I said, the guy changes the map every time he submits it. It's like a brand new project. He can't get his act together to save his life. I've been surveying for 27 years. You've been doing it wrong for 27 years. But he passed that test. You can't walk backwards to heaven. Once saved, always saved. And then do whatever you jolly well please for the rest of your life. Verse 15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed of himself. Rightly dividing the word of truth. I have corrected myself regularly for things that I have thought was in the Bible and it wasn't. And one of them was this week. I cannot prove. With all of the study, I got really sidetracked on this and was looking for it. I had always believed that Jesus one time and only once went through the golden gate. The gate beautiful. On Palm Sunday was the only time he went through it. I believed that for years. This week I looked up the scripture to find out I was telling the truth. I can't find it. I don't know where I got the idea. But I've been saying it for years. I've given up saying it. I don't say it anymore. I'm not going to say it anymore as of this Sunday for the first time. (laughs) But I guarantee you it's the first time Jesus allowed the people to refer to him as a king. That I know is true. Study so you don't embarrass yourself (laughs) in front of friends and neighbors. And especially if you are recalled on to stand up in front of a bunch of people and talk. (laughs) I was... Our, uh, we were going to church when we first got married. And, and uh, Della's sister is, uh, she needs to really come out of her shell, you know. She just went, woo-hoo. <laughs> she hears something, she'll let you know. <laughs> we. <laughs> My daughter talks about having, <laughs> we went to, we, <laughs> we went to dinner at Chili's. And the gal brought us our drinks and forgot to give us straws. She was behind us helping another table and said, she forgot to give us straws. I turned around, looked at her, and I scooted my chair over. I reached into her apron, grabbed a handful of straws, came right back over. (laughs) My daughter wanted to crawl under the table. (laughs) Hey, you know. (laughs) We're sitting in church, and this guy starts talking. The word Easter is not in the Bible. Here comes... Della's sister. Ah, oh, yes, it is. You know, up, where'd that come from? You know, I don't know who that person is. Acts chapter twelve, verse four in the King James Bible it says Easter. That guy wouldn't accept it. Oh, it's not there. And I'm sure to this day he refuses to accept that it's there. Don't bother me with the facts. My mind is already made up. Yeah. <laughs> we need to be submissive to God and recognize that we are learners. I learn from you guys. I do. There's, a, there's, there's some people not in this class anymore because I corrected them in front of everybody and they don't like the correction. They haven't been back. I'll be careful. <laughs> <coughs> one guy, some of you will know who I'm talking about. One guy referred to his problem as an addiction. I have an addiction. I said, no, you don't. you got to sin. It's an addiction. I says, I don't care what the American psychologists tell you. It is sin, Bubba. In this class, it's sin. Because let me tell you something, Jesus did not die for addictions. He died for sins. And until you get a grip and realize that what you are involved in is sin, you can't take it to the cross <laughs> and get forgiven of it. What's more important? huh? Get that stuff out of your life and put it behind you and let God help you through it. And until we recognize that it is sin against God and man, we can't get out of our mess. That's it. That's in Scripture. You know, I have sinned before you. This is what the little, the little boy said when he came home to daddy, the prodigal son. I have sinned before you and God. You can't draw water out of dry well. Pastors are poor representatives of the Lord and do a disservice to the congregation when they get behind the pulpit and wing it. I remember our dear beloved uh, Jim Swanson who said that one Sunday morning as he apologized to the entire congregation. I winged it last week, and I want to stand up here and tell you I am sorry I did it. 
and for all the times that I have, stood in front of you behind this desk and winged it. That I'll never forget that day. I have just absolutely put him on the highest pinnacle of pastors I have ever met because of his willingness to stand up and say that. It takes study to know what the Bible truly says. It takes a lot of devotions and meditating to present God's word so that the people can understand it and use it in their daily lives. It isn't easy, but God will help. The word Paul uses, rightly dividing in Greek, means to cut it straight. It's a farmer's term when plowing a straight furrow. You get the word of God straight. And don't just teach tradition. Well, you know, well, uh, never mind, I'm not going to go there. The pastor is a workman in God's word. The word is a treasure and must be guarded. It's the soldier's sword and the farmer's seed, but it is also the workman's tool for building, for measuring, for repairing God's people. The preacher and the teacher who use the word correctly will build their church the way God wants it to be built. But a sloppy worker will handle God's word deceitfully in order to make it say what he wants it to say. When God tests our ministries, some of it, sad to say, will become nothing but ashes, wood, hay, and stubble. Because we didn't put our best into it, why should God give us a reward for sloppy effort? We were listening to Robbie Zacharias this last week, and uh, it's, just, uh, it's, it's one of the saddest messages I ever heard him present. That he went to one of the universities here in the United States and had a 350-pound bodyguard as he walked onto the campus because of the hatred for the things that he stands for as a Christian man. He said he wept that such a thing had to take place in the United States. When he goes to Muslim countries and he's safe, they won't attack him. They'll listen to him. Not here. And he takes a passage of scripture from Nehemiah talking about building the wall. And I thought, I remember some guy talking about a wall. Everybody's having a fit. And it's exactly what happened in the day of Nehemiah when he approached the king, Esther Monday night, listeners, Artaxerxes, the son of Vashti, the queen, after Xerxes, Ahasuerus, died, his son, Artaxerxes, came to the throne under Esther's rulership, Mordecai's insistence. His father had his life saved and spared, and she, among all the Jews, had brought them in in favor and guess who it is that is the cupbearer for the son of the king whose life was saved by a Jew? Nehemiah, a Jew. And when he says to the king, I want to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city walls. The king doesn't ask him why. He says, when you're coming back, I'm going to miss you so much. Tell me when you're coming back because I can't stand being departed from you. He loved him that much. Respected him that highly. And in 52 days, they rebuilt that wall, the walls of Jerusalem, under difficulty. When everybody around them said, what are you doing building a wall? Who do you think you are building walls and protecting yourself? The world tells you and me to shut up as Christians. Well, excuse me. I got real excited about it a week or two ago. There's a wall of separation between the church and the state, and that goes both ways. Neener, neener, neener. <laughs> you can't tell me to shut up. You won't let me tell you how to run the government? Don't tell me how to run my Christian life. Amen. Right. Amen. Pound sand in love. Look, you more of this on Monday night, so everybody come. Y'all come now, you hear? <laughs> Moses' uh, uh, vessel is verses 20 and 21. These are the seven things that Paul talks about that we should be as... Pastors, teachers, and Christians. Teacher, somebody that studies, vessel. Verse 20, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for, for honor and some for dishonor. Do you understand he's talking about a poop bucket? That's what he's talking about. Buckets of dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace. Those who call on the Lord out of a 
pure heart. Moses said in number 16.5, the Lord will show who are his. Departing from iniquity, we are admonished to live godly lives because we are what Peter said. We're a royal priesthood, priesthood, a holy nation. We are his own special people. It says peculiar in the King James and it means it's a picture word that means standing in the middle of a circle. The word peculiar in Greek means you are in the middle of a circle and the circle is our living God who is surrounding us at all times. You are a special people to him. We are a great house is the one that God is building. We are living stones, Peter said in chapter two, assembled together to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Our lives become trophies in heaven of his great mercy, his great grace and his power to save the worst of sinners. And we will stand in heaven's court And God said, look what I can do with this that everybody has rejected. You literally, Cheryl, (laughs) this is interesting. They're funny stories. She's gone to work. And the head of the department has got a doctorate degree. And the two of them look like, you know, mirror face to face. And everybody kept calling her doctor something. (laughs) When she was walking around, only been there three days. (laughs) <laughs> and then they met each other in the elevator. <laughs> you look alike. It's too funny. We will look like Jesus. We will look like him. The moment we step into heaven's gates, we will be changed into his likeness, a reflection of his glory. I can't count the number of people over the last 40 years that I've been teaching and serving in the church who ask for prayer. And when they feel good, they don't show up. (laughs) I wasn't thinking this when I asked Dave to pray. I (laughs) I was talking with a pastor who said that there's several people in the church who are always asking for prayer for their family. But when their family comes to visit, they stay home. Jesus had the same problem. There were ten lepers that Jesus healed, but only one came back and said thank you. In the first century church... They didn't have running water and inside plumbing. They had vessels used for nourishment and others for waste. You know, one of the fun things to do with teenagers is get them to take out the trash. (laughs) Oh, my gosh, you'd think it was the end of the world. (laughs) Ah, and they drag, you know. Tell them you're going to go to a movie and they'll beat you to the car. (laughs) Paul reminds Timothy that in church there are vessels of praise and vessels of shame. Some vessels, church members, bring honor and glory to things of God, but there are also those who have mingled their lifestyle with that that is corrupt and the baser things of the world. They bring dishonor to the assembly. They are fit for nothing but to be discarded, lest, if they remain, they spoil and pollute the vessels of honor. I have to watch myself that I don't get like that. I get get tainted by the world and and have the world affect the way I teach. How many of you know it already has? (laughs) Now I'll tell my funny story. Okay. <laughs> Our uh, daughter was small. She was on the playground, and she fell off the jungle gym and hurt her arm. Poor me, my arm. So Della went to the school, picked her up, and they went to the hospital. Oh, me and my arm, you know, broken, broken arm. Then they brought in this monstrous x-ray machine, opened up the curtains and brought in this transformer thing. <laughs> oh, my arm's fine. No problem at all, you know. <laughs> As soon as she saw that machine, you know, it was hilarious. We still laugh about it. You know, it's just being a kid. Um, sometimes uh, during being investigated by the Holy Spirit, you know, I like to say, I'm okay. And we're not. We need to be investigated and looked at and x-rayed. Verse 24, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be uh, gentle to all. Able to teach and patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. It's it's servant work. If God perhaps will grant them uh, repentance so that they may know the truth and uh, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Uh, There's no such thing as freedom in a vacuum. 
We'll end up serving Satan or we'll end up serving God. And when we serve ourselves, we're serving the devil. You, I, I can't tell you the number of times I've dealt with people. You do exactly what they want and they're still not happy. Because they don't know what happiness is by definition. We were talking about somewhat, me and my son, Ken. And I said, you know, dealing with that person is their way or the highway. And he says, not with that person. There's no highway. They'll chase you down and make sure you do it their way. There is only their way. Jesus told his disciples that a servant is one of our name tags. That is literally the most important name tag we can have. Servant. David said of himself, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than, in essence, be king. Serve the people. I remember one time working with a gal and she said she'd love to go to the airport and drink coffee. This was back in the day when you could go watch people get on planes and greet their loved ones and say goodbye to loved ones as they were boarding planes. And I said, why do you do that? She says, I just love watching people go have fun. They're going someplace. They're enjoying life. And I think that's what Paul was talking about. Folks going to church, they love God. And this is the time when you just take the whole world off your shoulders, leave it at the door, and go in and worship your Savior. Paul calls himself a slave of Christ in Romans 1 and Philippians 1. He says, once we were slaves to sin, but now we have true freedom as slaves to Jesus Christ. God's slave does not have an easy time teaching the word. Satan opposed him and tried to trap him. Some people are just naturally difficult to teach. They enjoy foolish arguments, he said. There's no desire to feed on the nourishing word of God and until you have experienced it. You have no idea how difficult it is to impart spiritual truth to some people who are more interested in having fun. <clears throat> they come to church to have fun. And it is, it is said that in the last days people will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. The small church pastor that is preaching God's word faithfully, studying his head off every week and watches his congregation dwindle because a big church has got fun and the people leave. The word recover in verse 26, it describes a man coming out of a drunken stupor. Satan makes people drunk with his lies and the servant's task is to sober them up and rescue them. The last phrase in verse 2 or chapter 2, verse 26. They are delivered out of the snare of the devil who took them captive so that they might do God's will. As you review these seven aspects of working ministry, you will see how important and how demanding the work of the ministry is. It's no place for loafers. It demands discipline and effort. Church members need to pray for their pastors and encourage them in their work. Church officers should faithfully do the work that the pastors can devote themselves to study. Churches should provide enough financial support for the ministry so that they can fully devote themselves to the work of the ministry. Galatians 6, those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. 2 Corinthians 9, now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both ministers bread for the food and multiply your own your seed sown, increases the fruits of your righteousness. Acts 20, remember the words of the Lord. It is more blessed to give than receive. In Matthew 10, 41, if you receive a prophet as one who speaks for God, you will be given the same reward as the prophet. And if you receive righteous people because of their righteousness, you will be given a reward like theirs. And if you give even a cup of cold water and one of the least of my follow followers, you will surely be rewarded. Amen. Amen. Next week, next week, the cross week after chapter three, second Timothy. Top of your other notes. Christ in the triumphal entry. I've got 12 minutes. I'm going to skip the full reading of this. Just look at the one verse. Remember what we read. This is the day the Lord has made. Uh, jumping down to verse 37. When they reached the place where the roads started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord, they said. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest heaven. But uh, some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers from saying things like that. He said, If they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. Verse 41. Now, what, what I read up to then was a New Living Translation. This 
is the New King James Version, starting with verse 41. As he drew near, he saw the city and began to weep, or he wept over it, saying, If you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you, when your enemies will build an embankment around you and surround you and close you in on every side. You know, that's what happened when the Romans conquered Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Verse 44, And level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Finally, he says, Because you did not know the time of your visitation. If you will remember when Jesus was born, King Herod sent the uh, scholars back to the Bible to find out uh, what was the story about where Jesus would be born. They came back and said, well, he's going to be born in Bethlehem about this time. That's what they had presumed. And here's these kings now coming to worship him because the king has been born. And when they uh, didn't come back to Herod, then Herod decided he would kill every child under two years of age and under in this village where he knew that Jesus had been born. And the angel came and told Mary and Joseph, get out of Dodge and go to Egypt. And when they were there, then he says, okay, now you can go back because the old fox is dead. This is Palm Sunday, and all across the world, ministers and teachers will be reading a passage, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Jesus entering Jerusalem on Sunday before his crucifixion is a fulfillment of that prophecy. Christians call it Palm Sunday and rejoice that another prophecy proving that Jesus is the Messiah has been fulfilled. You'll find this event, the coming of Christ into Jerusalem, in all four Gospels is listed that I give you those passages. Jesus entered Jerusalem through the Golden Gate or the Eastern Gate on the opposite side of Mount Olives. If you stand on the top of Mount Olives to this day and look at the Eastern Gate or the Golden Gate, which is sealed up, that's not the one. The one that Jesus went through is underneath where the tombs are. It's covered in dirt. In 1983, in Biblical Archaeology Review, Before they put up the fences to keep you out of that area, one of the archaeologists of of that area had gotten his camera and was early in the morning, wanted to get a nice, pretty picture of the, the Golden Gate. And while he was standing there, he fell into a mass grave. They had put a lid over the top of it, and it was a crumbly lid. He fell down. Here's all the skulls and the bones and everything from a whole bunch of people they had buried and put in a hole. And as he looked at the wall with the light shining through, he saw the arch of the one that was built by, rebuilt by Nehemiah. It was still there. He took pictures of it and he showed where all of this was. He came out and began to write his paper. He went back the next day to take some more pictures and they had fenced the area off and now you can't get there anymore. But the one that's sealed off is not the one. The one underneath that he took a picture of, that's the one Jesus went through. And when Jesus comes back, it says that his foot will touch Mount Olives. It will split. And a gully washer flood will flow through the Kidron Valley. And all of those graves and all of that dirt and everything will be swooshed out of the way to reveal the gate underneath. And that's the one he will go through. And that's the one he went through here. This is a fulfillment of a passage from 483 years in the book of Daniel. Again, proving that the Bible is the word of God. And that Jesus is the Son of God. The Bible is the one and only religious book of all the world's religious books that is truth in print. It is the only book that provides us with such prophetic detail. The only religious book. Massive prophetic detail of events that have happened exactly the way the Bible said they would happen. And we have about 200 more that tell about the second coming of Christ that are yet to be fulfilled. And they will be. It is the fulfillment of these prophecies that we take joy in recognizing we have the right book. We have the right religion. We're serving the right person. He is the only way, truth, and life. Hallelujah. Doctrinal lesson. Jesus went to Bethany to be with Lazarus on Saturday. And it says in John chapter 12 that on the next day he went into Jerusalem, which would be Palm Sunday. So Saturday 
on the Sabbath day, he's in Bethany with Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. And it says, whom he had raised from the dead, referring to Lazarus. Unfortunately, there are a number of folks in the Orthodox churches who refer to Saturday as Lazarus's day, Saturday of Lazarus, and believe that that's the day that Jesus raised him from the dead. And then the next day was Palm Sunday, and that is celebrated around the world by Orthodox Christians. The people gathered, knew Jesus, the rumor had gotten around Jesus was in town, and he had raised Lazarus from the dead, and they, if you read John, they wanted to see Lazarus. They wanted to see the guy raised from the dead. Jesus was incidental to them. And it's not too far a cry from the way we treat church now. We want to come see the miracles. We want to come see the fluff. We want to come see the razzle-dazzle. And Jesus is on the outside. Can I come in too? Knock, knock, knock. Other times, the people looking at Jesus said of him, let's make him king, like the day when he fed 5,000 and he disappeared. There were other things that he did, and they wanted to make him king again. Uh, what they were looking for was free welfare. Uh, let's, let's join up with the guy that creates the Walmart centers wherever we go. Hallelujah. And it's free for us. Let's make him king. Get all these goodies. And Jesus disappeared. But then he came in on this day, and they said, oh, he is the king. He is the son of David. He is the splendid one that comes. And he said, that's right. And when, they, when the Pharisees said, Tell your followers to shut up. He said, nope. And I would say that that is true today. If you feel like anybody you're witnessing to wants you to shut up, you take it to Jesus and have Jesus deal with that person and have him shut them up. There's another prophecy almost completely overlooked. It was exactly why Jesus wept. You did not know the time of your visitation. They did not know the time of the coming of the Messiah, the Prince. They did not know the time of the coming of the Messiah, the Prince, Daniel 9.25. You read verses 24 to 26, you have the prediction of the 70 years, 70 weeks of years, 490 years that are determined upon the city and upon the Jew, upon Jerusalem and the Jewish people. Jesus said many times he said that his hour had not yet come, but now his time had come. Number two on the top of page two. God obviously appointed a particular day and time when the Messiah would be presented to the nation. Galatians 4.4 4 said, In the fullness of time Jesus had come. That term means when the exact moment when a cup is full to the brim. At that point, that's when the fullness of time had come. And the fullness of time for Jesus to be revealed as the king of the Jews was Palm Sunday. In Psalm 118, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Is referring to the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ. Number four, Luke 19, Jesus lamented, if you'd only known about this day, this thy day. Number five, Palm Sunday is the tenth of Nisan. Jesus entered Jerusalem as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John chapter one. This is the same day, Palm Sunday, that the high priest selects an unblemished lamb for the Passover sacrifice. Jesus is presented to the people of the same day that the priest grabs a lamb and said, this is the one who is the sacrifice for our sins for Passover. Same day Jesus walked in. This is the day the Lord has made. After 70 years of captivity in Babylon, Daniel knew from Jeremiah that the time of their deliverance had come. He was taken in his youth at 17 or 18. He's now nearly 90. Others will return, but he will not. The angel Gabriel comes to him and tells him, it's not only 70 years, my friend, it's 70 times 7. Jumping down to the 70 weeks, 490 years, which are divided into three parts, the angel continues. The first part is seven weeks, referring to the rebuilding of the city during troublesome times. From the day that the decree goes forth to the completion of the rebuilding of the city will be 49 years. And then there will be 62 additional years, or weeks rather, times seven, with a one remaining week left over. At the end of 69, the seven plus the 62, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. This is Daniel chapter 9. Sir Robert Anderson's classic work, The Coming Prince, written in 1894, gives us the picture. Gabriel says to Daniel in 9, Seven times seven, 49 years rebuilding the city. 
62 times 7, 434 years later, Messiah is going to be cut off for a total of 483 years to the day. And if it isn't to the day, God's not God. And it was. The Jewish and Babylonian calendars are 360-day years. 483 years ends up being 173,880 days. After the commandment was given to rebuild the city. When was that command given? It came from the Persian king Artaxerxes to Nehemiah to restore the walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah is careful to tell us that this commandment was given to him on Nisan, the 20th year of the king Artaxerxes' reign. It turns out to be on our calendars, if we were to use our Gregorian calendar and go back to B.C., it would be March 14th, 445 B.C. is the date that Nehemiah was given the command to go rebuild the walls of the city. From that day, using the Jewish calendar, 173,880 days later, gives us April 6th, 32 A.D., which is Palm Sunday. This is the day the Lord has made. Jesus said, if you'd only known the day of your visitation. It was on Passover day at three in the afternoon when Jesus gave up the ghost. It is finished. That same moment was when the lamb in the temple was being sacrificed on Passover day. Same moment. There is yet remaining a seven year period to be fulfilled. This period is the most documented period in the entire Bible. The book of Revelation chapter six through 19 detail that climactic final 70th week, seven years of tribulation referred to in the Greek as the tribulation, the great one. God is a date setter. And when we look back and see how he keeps his dates perfectly, we can rejoice in a God who controls the universe, controls the world, controls nations, controls peoples. And if we will turn our lives over to him, he will give us a marvelous life of freedom and joy in him that fades not away because we can rejoice. Our God reigns. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and for your faithfulness to it and for the lessons that we can learn from it. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name upon each one. May they receive joy this week as we reflect on the time that is coming just around the corner, the joy of the Resurrection Sunday. We look forward to it and ask your blessing upon each one in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, everybody. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Amen, amen.